discussion with you. So I just want to tell you, thank you for reading the bios and understanding the knowledge base um, that is coming to you today. Uh, thank you for reading the land acknowledgement and giving yourself some time to understand what being on this land and in this environment means to you. I also really want to thank Uche, Rianne, and Jenna for offering their insights and their expertise and their heart uh, and their time on this today. I'm really, really delighted to share this space with them and to facilitate, facilitate this conversation. Um, so just a quick note that we will be sending out a PDF afterwards uh, that's gonna have additional readings and calls to action. And they will also include the full bios for Jenna, Rianne, and Uche. So on that note, uh, let's get started. <clears throat> so when we think about writing ethically, um, the first problem we have is a problem of definition. So how are we defining ethics? Um, and is there sort of like a one size fits all when it comes to that? Um, and if we are trying to write with this philosophy, whose ethics are we sort of talking about? Uh, are we talking about our ethics? Are we talking about society's ethics? If we are talking about society's ethics, are we talking about the values society has right now? Or are we talking about the values that we want society to have as it evolves? Uh, and then sort of adding to this like really complex question, uh, we've also seen the rise of people in media pushing harmful agendas um, and they're cloaking it in, as their attempt to bring society back to like the noble path and bring society back to the good. And this kind of begs another question. So in the current climate, uh, how are we navigating our personal ethics against what seems to be the, let's just catch and hold the public's attention for the one second we have. So if I can sort of take that question, and Uchi, may I pass it on to you to start us off on this? Uh, thank you very much, Natasha. I'm so honored to be sharing this space with uh, Jenna, Ryan, and Natasha. And uh, I also want to use this opportunity to appreciate the Writers Guild of Alberta for making this conversation, uh, which is a conversation a lot of people wouldn't want to tackle. And Natasha, you've asked a rather complex question, which would take at least 30 page essay to address. And so I'm just gonna do my best to, to, to bring my thoughts together and then put it out there for Jenna and Ryan to, maybe take them apart. So I think uh, ethics will always be ethics. And the way I see it, it comprises a recognition, a receptivity and relationship. So sometimes I call them the three R's. So and in, in South Africa, they have this philosophy or humanist philosophy, which is called Ubuntu. I am because you are. And sometimes it can also be coded this way, I see you. So in scene one, you are recognizing them. You are also being receptive to their humanity. And this recognition and receptivity are meant to define and structure how you will relate or what kind of relationship you foster or you hope to foster with them. And so looking at ethics, society will always have its own values. And every writing, in my own understanding, is a way to challenge or rethink some of those dominant values society has, because those values usually tend to show up certain elitist worldview, and which is why I see all writing as an attempt to reimagine how we recognize how we are open to difference and how we relate with each other. So perhaps ethics has to do with how do we learn to live together? How do we learn to affirm each other's humanity? And so if that is the basis from which we write, it becomes easier to really forge relationship across divides, whether they are social, political, economic, religious, or otherwise. So I just want to put this as a sort of 
uh, give out uh, to my fellow panelists. No, that's that's so beautiful. And I mean, we talk about this, right? That in writing, uh, the first rule is you respect your you respect your reader, you respect your audience. Um, and I love that. I see you as a way to create like space and empathy. So, uh, Jenna, can I can I toss it to you now? Yeah, absolutely. And and Uche, thank you for starting us off in such a beautiful and a profound way. I like that that element of relationality very, very much. Um, I was thinking about how, uh, you know, personal ethics hold us accountable to ourselves, but they really, they hold us accountable to our work, to one another, to our readers. Um, I think in many ways, they kind of help us to keep perhaps our, our personal ambition as writers. Um, in check against our responsibilities to our communities, to the people we are writing about and for. Um, and when I think about ethics, personal ethics, as a writer, I think a lot about intentions in the work. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so many of the discussions around ethics and texts that have fallen afoul of ethics and ethical responsibility um, seem to have an, at, at their grounding an element of what the writer's intention was you know, um, did they consider uh, did, did they consider the potential impact on a community or a particular group? Did they consider, um, there's also the ethical implication of thinking about how things are going to come back to you as well as a writer. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what are those intentions towards our characters, to our readers? Do we hold them in the front of our minds? And do we, um, I think there's that, again, that element of writerly ambition that sometimes um, we find ourselves pushed Right, and we have to really hold on to those those personal ethics that say I have this responsibility. This text is grounded in responsibility to community, or in responsibility in how I write this character because this character is part of a community. It's not just a single being kind of floating out there. Um, and part of your question, Natasha, I think, was talking about: Are we writing about the writing to the world as it is now, or are we writing kind of into the future? And I, I, I mean, speaking from uh, multiple marginalized communities, I think we are writing towards a type of future that we want to see, you know, and, and that we have to, um, pulling through some of the best in what we see in writing and publishing right now, but also recognizing that we still have a long way to go in terms of adhering to those personal ethics and really relating to and seeing one another wholeheartedly. Yeah. No, that's great. So it's, it, so if, you know, if we have uh, first respect your audience, and second, sort of the the writerly uh, Hippocratic oath, right? First, do no harm. Uh, that's th th I think that's such. So, um, Rayanne, what would you add to that, like that triangle? Um. So I think that you know Uche ta talked about, and then Jenna touched on this idea of the. The respect, but also um, challenging the dominant lens and challenging the dominant values, um, which I think when we think about the intention of, of ethics and around the writing, for me, that's where I sit most fully in my processing around the ethics of the writing is this idea of challenging the dominant values, especially if you're a member within that dominant group. What are you doing to challenge um, those dominant values if you sit within that group? Um, and then along with that, when we're thinking about this commitment to, to future, um, what are you doing within that dominant group to a commitment to challenge as a writing into the future, right? There's there's often conversations about, which we may get into it um, further on, around the way uh, historical um, stories are written uh, or, you know, historical lenses and whether or not we should be writing outside of that lens. And so for me, within the terms of looking at this as an as ethics and writings and, and the relationship to the intention, that that commitment to challenging that historical lens becomes imperative in the way I want to approach the future um, writing or the way we challenge that that particular lens. That's gorgeous because I, I think what it also talks about is like um, the idea of like, remember your place in history, right? In tw 20 years from now, five years from now, um, how will people remember the things that you did? And, and we can all think of books that like, 
in the moment were highly, highly successful. And then, you know, you fast forward 10 years um, and the, the lens is different because people realize there was, there was harm created in those stories, even though someone was trying to like be good and do no harm, they actually created harm. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, any, any last minute thoughts on, from uh, any of you regarding this? If I can just uh, chip in just a little bit. Yeah, uh, I think uh, Jenna and Ryan, they, they made such insightful contribution to really think about futurity. But I also want us to take a pause to also look at the, the moment because in as much as we mm -hmm. were thinking about the future, for some people, the future is already foreclosed. And so why we have an eye towards the future, we should also be attentive to the now. Yeah, uh, that's, when that's you say the future is all, is, for some people, the future is already foreclosed. Can you clarify yeah. that for? Yeah, so for some people, the future is almost dystopic. And for some mm. people, the future is already full of optimism, full of sunshine. Yeah. And so they, they 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 have this enthusiasm to look forward to a future. And then for some people, the future is so overwhelming, so bleak, so so gloomy. So to to really look for a future, to really imagine or to even imagine a future becomes problematic. And so even mm -hmm. as as we as we strive to I mean, imagine a different order to what is happening in contemporary times, we also needs to see how we can reimagine this now to yeah. account for our journey towards the future. Yeah, Jenna, Rayanne, I, I see you both nodding along with this. Uh, any any closing thoughts? Rayanne, go first, go first. You're, you're both being very Canadian and polite. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that the, the thing that I'm taking away also from Uche's um, addition there is this idea around the space that we take up and I don't mean that in the way of we should consider how much like that a specific writer should consider how much space but the way they're using that space and the intention behind the way they're using that space or writing into that space um, and I think that's something that for me as um someone who uh, is a part of a, a you know a, a marginalized community as a, a woman we you know we'll talk a lot about the misogyny and violence against women in writing and and things that are still happening with with women in um in the ethics of writing but also as you know belonging to a dominant dominant um culture uh here in Alberta specifically the idea of the way I'm existing in the space in the 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 ethics of the space that I'm ex existing in is something that I need to be constantly considering as well as pushing against or pushing into. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Jenna, do you want to close this off for us? Sure. Sorry, I was a little slow on the button push there. <laughs> um, I'm just going to go back to what Uchi was saying and and express my gratitude for how you phrased. That, that need in order to even begin to consider a future for so many communities and so many writers from um, diverse communities uh, and that that future might itself be very problematic. Um, and the, the thought of, um, I guess, coming down back to the ethics of the present is how we do that caretaking amongst our communities as writers and as people right now, so that collectively, you know, we can even write and think towards potential futures yeah um and have a sense of agency to be able to get there yes um, yeah you really really appreciate your words thank you that's beautiful um i'm going to move on to the next question but just a note to our friends in the audience if you have questions please feel feel free to put them in the chat we will uh, reserve some time uh, at the end of the session to to acknowledge and, and answer as many questions as we possibly can um, Ryan, we were talking about you. You mentioned misogyny, so let's jump into this. So we're seeing a rise of book bannings, um, and uh, the idea that some books have to be taken from public consumption because 
they're normalizing identities, experiences, communities that are considered like harmful to society. Um, and so like the question of, <laughs> The question of whether a group or organization uh, has a right to censor uh, on behalf mm. of society is like a whole other panel. So we're not we're not going to go there. Um, but what it's sort of leaving is this idea of like reader agency. Um, and that is the the idea that readers have the right to pick up uh, and or put down books that don't align with their values, um, no matter how ignorant or outdated other people may you know find those values or find those books. Uh, but then the question is like, where is a writer's ethics and a reader's agency when we're dealing with works where it can be argued that harm is present um, and or harmful ideas are being normalized? And so uh, the the example I'm thinking about was with Game of Thrones, uh, and it was regarding the glorification of violence against women. Uh, and the argument that many, many of these scenes were not there to serve any story purpose. They were there to specifically cater to a very specific group within a community uh, who wanted to see violence against women sort of perpetuated and romanticized, glorified, you know, fetish. Um, and so we also see sometimes too within like the romance industry, um, the continuing idea of certain like harmful ideas. So. Um, my love can change him. Um, the romanticization of abuse within uh, within relationship or from romantic partners, um, and it's so much so that you know I think many of us have attended writing workshops and these books are held up as like the epitome of great storytelling and this is what you want to do because wow look how successful it was. Um, and so Ryan, can I start with you and ask the question about where is the balance? Uh, for a writer between acknowledging the reader, acknowledging themselves, and then acknowledging an industry that will often put profits ahead of quality or integrity. Okay, so I have so many notes uh, and thoughts many on thoughts. that I am going to try and I'm going to try and go through them all um, in hopefully a way that begins to move them together. So one of the first things that I want to think about when we think about um, writing um, such as the Game of Thrones is this consideration of women as authority at the expense of other women coming into their power because of emotional or physical trauma. So the expense of one at the other. Uh, I also want us to think about the idea of um, are writing in, in this material as um, sexualized gendered violence versus gendered violence. Um, we see gendered violence written around men um, in that, uh, 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 an example that uh, uh, I'll use, you know, someone gets their hand cut off versus um, a woman's character development uh, comes at, at um, the expense of rape, right? So sexualized gendered violence versus gendered violence and how we perceive those um, things to be a, a mechanism for a character's development or growth. Um, so we see violence being used as this mini trope, um, but then we can also, you know, to go back to the Game of Thrones, I wanna bring in another um, book into that conversation, which is Outlander by um, Diana Gabaldon, specifically because we're looking at this romance. So Game of Thrones was written by a male lens, a modern male lens. Um, Outlander was written by a female lens, um, arguably not that modern, right? The, the books originally were uh, older. And yet both of them are littered with sexualized violence uh, against women and massive amounts of, of rape and, and used as a trope to growth. Um, and so... Okay, so that's that, that. There's that lens, um, and then we also have to flip that and consider how um, the Me Too movements have changed some of this. So, um, Game of Thrones season eight shifted some of that lens. Uh, new writers, not George R. R. Martin, um, and there was a a real shift in the lens of women empowerment becoming the leaders in that. Um, and yet we can look at this concept as well as normalizing violence towards women 
as historical, um, a correct historical context. But what we see often in fantasy genres, there's written as historical, and yet we normalize dragons in the same way that we say we must normalize violence against women because this happened in a historical context, and yet we're writing we're writing dragons, or those authors are writing about dragons. So the fact that we're saying we must do that because it's historically correct is an incorrect argument, right? So we we need to consider that lens as well if we're talking about the the ethics around writing, you know, misogyny, um, and then. To carry on even one step further, I want to take a very immediate look at what has happened with Barbie. Um, we saw the film Barbie created. Uh, we now see the Oscars have come out and the male figure in that role was awarded a nomination. The female lead uh, was not the, the um, Greta Gerwig was, was not. And so we go back to the lens of, um, which brings me hopefully, to round this all out, the lens of what we consider having value and impact in women's writing. So we consider the value of trauma as being more impactful and valuable when we think about female character development than we do around the writing of um, strong women, um, but in the context of something like a romance trope to then lead to the next part of your question, I'm trying to get my points in in to make space for this um, this this fight between a, the the critic of of stigmatizing romance as not having impact, um, and then those who defend um, that kind of rape culture within romance to justify taste or kink um, in the writing of that and and the mass culture or mask market as meaning it lacks value because it's not being written from this particularly traumatic impact lens that we see in other um, writing used to justify it. I hope that's making sense um, as a way to frame that. So the problem is all of those things perpetuate patriarchy as the only winner. Yeah. I, maybe I'll well stop done. there and leave mm -hmm. that for more conversation. Yeah. No. Well. Well done. Well done. Because it's it's a big topic. Um, Jenna, can I jump to you for this? You absolutely can. Like Rayanne, you'll hear me rustling papers because I had I had far more thoughts than I had. I have notes everywhere. Um, I think I'm going to just jump back in Natasha and kind of go back to some of the original points that you had asked as well. Um, I'm going to briefly just touch on the restriction of books and then the the um, the thinking about our own prejudices, readers and as writers. Uh, just a just a um, small note that I mean restricting access to books as well, but because you might consider some of the the material they hold um, to be difficult, just uh, it flies right in the face of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, um, enshrining our collective freedoms of choice, and while also not condoning that choice to voice voice hatred. So I'm just going to put that out there in terms of so I think so often we get in into discussions of subjectivity and perhaps the fact that some of these these uh, concepts are enshrined in law kind of get shoved by the, way, the wayside. Mm -hmm. um, when we think about difficult topics as well, um, something that came up, I noticed in a, a, a number of the supplemental materials that are being provided as resources after this discussion was what we consider difficult and whether we as readers and as writers are really willing to lean into what we may consider difficult, particularly when it rubs up against our prejudice. Um, one of the things, one of the topics that was brought up in several of the articles was, okay, so for example, the difficulty of texts that involve bullying, right? How likely are parents or caretakers or guardians from multiple different backgrounds, how likely are they to push back on texts that involve bullying versus, for example, queer relationships, families with two fathers, things like that. And, and do we as writers and do we as readers, when we're thinking about what we um, take umbrage with, how often are we holding ourselves accountable for those frictions in ourselves, right? Um, do we choose to hold informed discussions about books in which harmful or prejudicial ideas are upheld? And I've been thinking a lot about the libraries right now, holding space for these informed discussions and saying, instead of as writers and as readers, we're just gonna unilaterally perhaps cut someone out. We're going to discuss some of these issues 
and do the emotional work together. Again, I recognize that that emotional work often falls on different communities and there's a cost, but how are we able to have these discussions? How are we able to support um, informing one another and supporting one another? Again, caretaking one another. Um, and and uh, I think last of all, because I have so many notes and I'm just gonna cut myself short. Um, you talked about where is the reader's agency in dealing with works where it can be argued that harm is present. I keep coming down to the fact that as readers and buyers and also as other writers, <laughs> you know, reading one another's texts, um, we can vet the books that we want access to in our lives and for the, the family members, the young people, the students, um, I, maybe not the students, the young people in our lives. Um, but we have no business uh, blocking access to those texts for the world, you know, and again, coming back to that idea that as writers and as readers, we really need to be in interrogating those touch points um, and saying, is this me trying to kind of overwhelm everything and, and speak for everyone? Or is this a, this a business that needs to be happening in, in my, my own thoughts and my own family and my own personal sphere? Yes. I hope that makes sense. So many, no, so many yeah. ideas. No, I know. I mean, uh, there's there's so many thoughts, and they they can be conflicting as well, right? I mean, this is this is the complexity of being alive. We we inhabit many places all at once. Mm -hmm. Uchi, can I please um, prevail upon you to sort of take us home on this on this question, please? Oh wow, yeah. Uh, well, I I think uh, Jenna and Ryan, they've just spoken much of what I had in mind. And uh, so which, so to really think about the ethics of writing and uh, accountability, uh, intentionality, and then creating spaces for difficult conversation, however difficult or reluctant we may want to engage with those conversations. And I think, Writing aspires, it aspires towards a sort of rethinking and to get people to rethink their positions, their perspectives on life is usually difficult. And so I think, because these questions are questions I'm still like thinking about almost every time I set out to write. And so I may not really have any definite any definite thing to say, but I I know a lot of the pushback or a lot of the tendency to wanting to ban books are uh, easily informed by certain anxieties, which could be cultural, mm -hmm. uh, national, or even local. And so sometimes it becomes difficult to even engage people to to just have a glimpse into how they are feeling and what is informing or fueling these anxieties towards, oh, we just have to censor, we have to repress, we have mm -hmm. to silence, we have to contain uh, or curtail people's voices. And then it, it's, it's an uncomfortable <laughs> conversation for me and I guess for a lot of people, because, and I think that's also part of the complexities or the dimensionality of ethics, because it's wanting people to see the world differently or to see the world from your own perspective. And your perspective may just be as flawed as theirs. And then, but how do we come to a space where we can say, oh, my perspective is flawed, but it can be shifted a little. Your perspective is equally flawed and it can be tweaked a little. And then can we see in a way that is mutually affirming of each other's inkling of their perspective. And so how the, the question would not be, how do we get to that space, to this middle space where we can look at each other and say, oh, well, how can we go beyond this mindset that is always wanting to contain and curtail people's mm -hmm. rights to articulate their own way of seeing the world or their own way of being in the world i think that's just that that's all i can say for for now yeah because these are these are quite uh provocative and uh 
they can be overwhelming questions. But I think yeah. having this space to to think through them or to think together with uh, Ryan and Jenna and uh, you, Natasha, mm -hmm. can also be a good way to to tease out the the naughty fans yeah. in those conversations. Yeah. Yeah, because there's not always one answer, and that's then, and as we sort of said at the beginning, there's not an answer fits all, right? And that's part of the the hardship of it is that we can't just like look it up in a tip sheet and be like, ah, yes, if it fits these parameters, this is this is what we do. Um, just looking ahead to the time, Jenna, I'm going to uh, please start with you on this. So, okay, so if we aim for ethics in our writing. Uh, and so we can say this sort of funnels down now into how an author is going to approach characters who don't uh, share their lived experience um, and the consequences when the public uh, believes an author to have acted in bad faith when creating like those characters. So in 2019, uh, Sourcebook Fire pulled the publication of Kosoko Jackson's debut YA novel, uh, A Place for Wolves at his request following criticism with uh, how he had represented the Kosovo, Kosovo War. Um, and then, you know, we fast forward to Janine Cummings and American Dirt, which also had a very similar controversy. Um, in her case, the book tour was canceled, uh, admit sort of these like, quote, unspecified threats of specific physical violence. Um, and it was a claim that the publisher then had to like they were forced to walk it back and admit that no such claims had ever been received towards this author. Um, yet one of the book's critics, um, Miriam Gurba, I hope I'm saying her name correctly, she did receive death threats for criticizing the book. So the question then is if both the reader and the author can face uh, this intense backlash when discussing integrity and ethics and how um, we're creating these characters that don't exist in the spaces that we exist in. The question is like, does that tension then create a sense of balance or is there a sense of imbalance with that? Jenna, what do you think? I'm gonna jump off the deep end here. I'm actually gonna go back and just um, very briefly address uh, one of those texts in particular and some of the critiques around it and then the feedback. Um, but I want to just kind of open with a quotation. It's from one of the supplemental texts. Again, I can't recommend people enough. We have a wonderful list of additional texts to which we're kind of speaking. Um, and this is something that Kavita Das said in her essay on the ethics of writing about social issues while minimizing harm. Uh, and Das reminds us that um, ethics are not ancillary to craft, but in fact, critical to the craft of writing, like foreground. It's not something that comes in in terms of marketing. It's not something that terms, comes in in terms of publication. It's like foreground your ethics and your responsibilities in your writing uh, for all of us, regardless of community. Um, and just as I come to that discussion of those two particular texts, I'm going to cherry pick. I'm just going to, I've been reading quite a bit about American Dirt and about Janine Cummings and uh, one of the criticisms that was leveled against Cummings, and there has been a lot of back and forth, um, was that she's a white writer at the time was identifying as a white writer. And and, the, and a lot of the critiques said, well, um, you shouldn't be writing outside your lane. Oh, can of worms going kaboom, right? Um, and a lot of, I think a lot of the feedback around that, that text is that it's not that. I mean, if we all write to our very specific backgrounds, our very specific demographics, where can we go? But the larger discussion I think that came out of that was her book appeals to an audience that has not gone out of its way to educate itself about prejudices against, in this particular case, about Mexican people. Um, and so this was a book that spoke into, um, leaned heavily onto, on stereotypes, on very tired tropes, uh, and then was upheld by the publishing industry. And I think we also, in terms of talking about agency as writers and readers, we also need to recognize there's that um, what's the responsibility of our publishing industry as well? The publishing industry then upheld the text as like, this is the text if you want to learn about, about these issues. And all of these things work together to really create an explosive situation. This is not the book by any means to teach people about the, in, the injustices being done to Latinx people. There are better books, better informed books, better grounded books, and more skilled books, right? So I think it, the discussion ends up being oversimplified and it's saying this writer is not allowed to write about this because of this. And it's like, well, think about the text itself. Think about um, the voids in, of information into which this text is speaking and drawing from. 
right? The reader's responsibility, the publisher's responsibility. There are a lot of things working together there. So again, we get the pushback and I'll, I'll cut this part a little bit shorter because I'm, I'm respecting our time here. I think um, the readers from marginalized communities responding to correct or inform or respond out of this visceral sense of being misrepresented. Um, I appreciate that there is that ability. I, what I have seen predominantly is a bigger backlash and here I look at what um, critics like uh, Miriam Gerber Serrano faced, and which included death threats, by the way, that were not walked back. Mm -hmm. um, whereas Cummins uh, did face did face threats, but they were I think the publishers tended to walk back uh, the uh, book launches as opposed to actually feeling worried for her physic physical safety. Um, so I appreciate the ability to provide feedback and to provide um, information in, in return to a, a writer and say, hey, these are some issues you might want to consider. I worry about how that impacts the people from marginalized communities who are providing that feedback. Um, and I do think the ability of, of, of readers from diverse communities to critique texts aimed at, uh, set in, or ostensibly speaking for those communities is vital, but it does put the emotional labor on to the communities, right, to provide that. So it begs the question again, how are we stepping up for one another and how are we providing allyship to one another, particularly if harm is being done through a text to a particular community? How are we holding one another to account and saying this is not okay, instead of expecting that pushback to come from people within the particular community to which harm has been done. Um, and the last, last little part of that is, I do also worry that increased um, pushback and controversy, I think it's vital, but I also worry about the publishing side of things because I think publishers sometimes um, will take turn tail and run if they anticipate complications in the potential text. And I think that's a discussion that needs to be had as well because that can lead to a kind of silencing. Oh. Absolutely. No, beautifully, beautifully said. Uche, can I um, toss it to you? Uh, yeah, thank you very much for those amazing insights as usual, Jen. So I recall uh, a couple of years ago, I asked uh, my Mexican friend if he had read American Dirt because it was all the rave. And I think it was also one of the books endorsed by uh, Oprah Winfrey. And he said, oh, well, that book is not about Mexico. It's just about the writer's own imagined Mexico. And he flat out, like, condemned the book that he wasn't going to read it. He just only read a few pages. And, uh, well, I, I attempted to read the first three or four pages. And the way it started, I said, well, I might as well just go watch a Hollywood movie. And so I'm sorry to say that I never got past the fourth uh, page. So, but then this question of, and I like the point uh, Jenna made about, oh, if we all just write about our community, how then can we understand or even build a relationship with other communities? But then the, the, the implication, the ethical implication that arises from one, wanting to write outside their community, particularly if you are a member of a dominant community and wishing to write about a marginalized community or a community that has been stereotyped, then for me, three questions make themselves available. One, why do you want to tell this story about this community? And then two, how will you tell the story about this community? And then three, what do you want readers to make of the story you've told about this community? And so that brings me to balance and imbalance of the kind of stories we choose to tell, or what Adichie would call the danger of a single story, and what our phobia, Chinna Achebe, will say, uh, that story fiction is always two sides, or two sides. One is the uh, beneficent fiction, that's fiction that aspires to affirm other people's humanity without flattening their complexity. And then the other one will be malignant fiction. That's fiction that rehashes stereotypes and dehumanizes the other or other communities. And so if I choose to write about someone whose experience is ma marginal or someone who has been stigmatized or marginalized, then 
the ethical obligation or responsibility I have is, can I tell that story as truthfully and as complex and as balanced as possible? But more importantly, am I the one who should tell that story? And so I'll leave that out there for us to think about. No, no. And I really, you know what, I really love that both of you bring out the point that um, the idea of staying in your lane uh, becomes incredibly restrictive to everybody involved. Um, and I think if we take it to its like ludicrous logical end, it basically means there will never be any more writers for, you know, kids and teens, because at the point in time we turn 18, we're no longer part of that community. Therefore, uh, we will never again have children who will read stories because those stories for them will never exist. Um, and then, you know, apologies to all the adult readers uh, and the adult writers because your your population will diminish because there's no kids who are growing up to become adult readers, right? Um, but but Rayanne, like, can I can I ask you to take us home on this? Uh, some really amazing, like, thank you so much to all three of you because some really beautiful, thoughtful um, points have been made. And I, I thank you. I thank you for um, being willing to be vulnerable and candid and honest with all of this. So Rayanne, yes, please. Um, yeah, I think I, I would just add on to this that ethically, um, I would would ask those dominant communities and in, in their writing to think about their own systemic and cultural biases um, before moving into writing those, um, you know, those characters, those those conversations, those etc. Right? It's one thing to it's a very flattening thing to say do your research um about those communities first and it's it's another conversation to say are you aware of your own systemic bias are you aware of your own cultural bias are you aware of what that means within the context of the the characters you may be developing or even the kind of research that you're doing um or you know those kinds of questions um you know perhaps a takeaway of that um one takeaway for that would be for us to um understand even what cultural bias is um, as, uh, you know, as an ethical consideration within our writing um, to understand or to have a, 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 an educational component to our writing that considers um, ethics in terms of dominant culture um, and the lens of publishers, which I think Jenna touched on, which I, I thought was so impactful, is the understanding of how the conflict with um, ethics and writings in uh, writing um, stories that are not your own uh, are impacted through the public, you know, the, the way the publishers deal with that conflict, right? And what that means um, for us. I think that might be the, you know, a couple of the takeaways um, that we should move into. And, um, you know, certainly even in some of the support material that you've, that we've got here, um, thinking about then also understanding and owning our own individual definition then of what ethics is or or what bias is. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Um, I'm seeing some comments in the chat and we've got about 14-ish minutes. So I'm going to just move us towards that. Um, I thank the three of you for pulling in that conversation about own voices and, and how we navigate that. So thank you very much for just being so, so smooth and effortless in, in all of that. Um, so Lorna has a, a comment regarding uh, the uh, Tucker Carlson um, is speaking tonight and there's 8,000 people who are attending um, despite the fact that 17,000 people signed a petition calling for the cancellation. Uh, I feel like the takeaway of that is that more than twice as many people were like, no. Uh, so I feel like there's there's hope in, in that moment. Uh, Catherine says, uh, Uche is touching on something as a professional group facilitator process host I think about how we collectively need to step into the middle space of difficult conversations when we don't or don't trust that we slash they have the skills to do so. Uh, in my opinion, COVID and the collective isolation we experienced has translated to a diminished ability to listen to risk to be cordial. Social media amplified the loss of these skills, the skills we need more than ever to help us reckon and work through the very issues we're exploring right now. 
Um, so thank you, Kevin, because that brings up a really good point about like uh, what all three of you touched on, which is like our own personal bias. So is there like one tip for someone who is saying, well, I, I don't think I'm biased. I think I'm a pretty like progressive live and let live kind of person. Um, is there is there like one tip we can give in terms of like, here's here's a good like check for yourself. Um, so uh, Jenna, can I, can I please start with you? Is there like a tip you can give for like, how do we know if we're engaging in our bias or if we're engaging in critical thinking? Like where's, how do we do this? In, in 30 oh, seconds. smokes! Yeah. <laughs> um, oh, Jen's here. Oh boy. Um, I, I find I'm asking quite often of myself a, a multi-part question. What What are my ethics, my personal ethics and responsibilities, right, to to community, to the writing? What is my timing? Am I stepping in front of someone whose story is coming from a community with more immediacy, um, more immediate lived experience? Um, and is there a time where as part of my ethics and my responsibility to community, I say, this is not my place. This is not my time. I step back. Mm -hmm. And then my intention for the work. And I'm constantly questioning again, Uchi, going back to what you said, why do I need to tell this story now? What is my intention? What is my hope for this work? And am I the right person to speak it right now? So Beautiful. constantly thinking. Beautiful. Yeah. Uchi, do you have anything that you can add to that? Well, uh, I think as writers, we we have powers, but of course those powers are also constrained by individual and uh, community and systemic and national constraints. But then I think one has to also, one of the, I don't know if it can be called it <laughs> a tip or a, a way of saying, but I think one thing would be acknowledging the kind of power you have and the privilege you have and then asking yourself do i use my power and privilege in a way that disavow someone else's experience their identity their reality or their way of being in the world beautiful beautiful thank you uh Rianne, how about you any any tip you can add to this um i th i think it's kind of bridging and touching on what both uche and jenna have have stated and when we think about you know how do we understand our bias or how do we recognize that the capacity to sit within your place, place of privilege um and look at those community cultural bi biases and you have an, an awareness of how that frames your own experience. So it's one thing to say, well, I think I'm, you know, recognized and, and am open to all experiences. And yet if, if we can't recognize where we sit within our community bias and how that frames potential systemic and cultural bias, that's, that's a risk. Um, and there was also something that I think Julie had, had posted in the, in the comments about also recognizing joy and I and I think we don't want to take that away either right I mean for myself as a as a woman writer I can recognize the ethics in ensuring you know conversations around misogyny are happening and yet I can still take joy in writing about women and mm -hmm. the the joyfulness of women which was a bit why I brought in that conversation around Barbie into the you know into the comments earlier allowing us to still sit within the beauty and the joy of our experiences and bringing that into our writing without flattening something and trying to claim everything as, as a universal experience, right? No, that's great. And uh, for those of you who may not um, be seeing this, who may be seeing this as the recording and, and may not have access to Julie's comment. And Rianne, I'm just gonna sit with you um, to follow up on, on Julie's comment. Um, and we've got like eight minutes, but I think Friends, I think we can do this. I think we can get in the last two questions if we, if we just, we can do this. Okay, so Julie says, uh, it's possible to think of ethics uh, to, in positive or negative terms. Much of our conversations tends to happen in the negative space, in the worry about harms. There are important conversations. These are important conversations to have, 
but I think it is just as important to explore ethics in the positive space. That is in a way that is ex um, that is expansive and joyful and that fuels the creative spirit. I worry that an imbalance risks creating a sense of constriction and inhibition that is not conducive to making art. Do any of the panelists have any thoughts about how to have these conversations or to establish an artistic practice that leans towards this expansive ethical mode? Um, so Ryan, we were just sort of sitting with you. Was there anything you sort of like wanted to add quickly before we like jump to Uche on this? Sure, I think <clears throat> the one takeaway that I would uh, have, you know, to add to this is that in order to have that expansive, joyful conversation around ethics, we also have to be willing to have these other conversations, right? These conversations that ask us to look at both sides. We cannot look at one without the other. Um, and we must be able to acknowledge um, bias and, um, you know, consent and all of those things uh, in order to have these expansive, creatively, uh, uh, beautifully challenging conversations. Beautiful, beautiful, Uche. Yeah, I really appreciate uh, Julie's incredible uh, perspective. And I want to say that to, to really think of ethics is also to acknowledge that it's capacious. It's also complex, but then to think of ethics is to also know that there's beauty as well as there is ugliness, that people are good and at times they can disappoint you, but then that doesn't make them less human. And so ethics is not only about the positive, it's also an acknowledgement of the negative that it's all, there's always tension. Even as I forge a relationship with you, I open myself to your own humanity you may take advantage of that, but that doesn't mean that I have to close myself off from exploring other forms of relationality. Mm -hmm. well, so good. within the positive, there's also those charges of the negative. And so acknowledging that ethics also affirm these different ways because it speaks to the complexity of the world or the messiness of the world. Yeah, well, the messy world, that is, that is well said. Jenna, can you please take us home on this? I think perhaps all I have to add is just um, from building off of both Uche and Rianne's amazing points, um, to remember that in those fraught conversations that we have with one another, um, like Uche said, like finding those, those common human threads and that we're, we have the ability to learn from one another at the same time that we're recognizing that, wow, there's an element where you don't think like me and I don't think like you, but also I'm learning from you at the same time. I'm learning things I wouldn't have had without the ability to sustain this complicated conversation. And um, it does, and it does take energy and it does take effort and it, it does take uncertainty, but it doesn't always have to, you know, that multi-part conversation, um, I think Julie, you made a good point. There's the recognition of the joy and the learning from those, from those conversations, as well as the recognition of the gravitas and the really fraught nature of some of those conversations. Yeah. yeah. All right, my friends, see if we can do this in in two minutes, and then we can uh, turn turn it back over to to Ashley, uh, and 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 Jarena, Adriana. I hope I'm I hope I'm saying this correctly. I, I mix up letters, um, so I apologize if I've gotten your name incorrectly. Uh, how do you view poetry of witness and your own role responsibility as writers to document current social issues and atrocities? I am thinking of gay Gazan poets like Mosab Abdu uh, Toha, who called for everyone to become poets writers to help document and spread awareness of what is happening in Gaza. So Jenna, can we, we were with you, let's just uh, start with you there. Um, I'm sitting with this very particularly right now, and I, I think um, uh, I, I do feel a deep responsibility to the, the poetry witness, the writing of witness, um, to hold space and, you know, at, at certain times to have space held for us. Um, and also to, to recognize when becoming poets of witness between our communities represents harm 
and mm -hmm. protecting one another so that we can do it anyway, right? That speaking up and speaking and holding space for other people sometimes might bring harm to you. And that's when we need to step in for one another and keep that space open so that we can keep witnessing and keep being present mm -hmm. without being too facile about it because it is very, very complicated. It is, it is. Thank you, thank you, Jenna. Uh, Rayanne, in a minute or less, what what can you say for us? I think this is something I'm I'm also currently really grappling with, and my only offering in this, in what I'm grappling with in writing as witness, is holding space versus taking up space. Mm. Um, and you know if that's where I'm sitting right now with with writing as witness of, uh, around that particular issue. I don't have an answer. No, I think that I think the fact that you don't have an answer is a is a beautiful answer in it, in itself. Uh, Uche, can you take us home on this, please? So I uh, so as you would notice, I like quoting China Chebe because he's so oh I'm using is well is <laughs> is late, but his work really grapples with a number of these questions, and then in one of his essays he called on writers to always not shy away from attending to the big question of their time. And so to try to relate it to Advana's question, every writer has a big question of their time. And it could be misogyny, it could be sexism, it could be uh it could be domestic violence or gender violence. It could be anti-blackness or it could be racism. It could be a war or genocide or whatever that is happening. And so I I don't prescribe for writers what to write. And I think every writing is a political act yes. or political act in as much as it may not be addressing what majority of the people identify or do not identify with. And so long as you are willing to just look at a slice or a strand of the human experience and then narrate or articulate it in a way that is true to a reality, then I think you've done something political and something mm -hmm. big. So but of course, I know some people tend to weigh writing in terms of scale. For me, I don't indulge in that sort of exercise. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. Um, and and like, what a beautiful end to this conversation. Um, on that note, can I please thank you, the attendees, on behalf of the panel and myself for joining us today for this for this conversation. I also want to thank the WGA for hosting and the Rosa Foundation for supporting uh, these these types of conversations. Thank you so much, Ashley. May I please turn it over to you now? Yes, thanks, Natasha. Um, thank you to Natasha, Jenna, Uche, and Ryan. I honestly, truly don't think we could have got a better group of writers to speak on this subject, albeit it was way too brief. Um, but I just, again, thank you to everybody for taking the time to to make this a really special inaugural panel in 2024. Um, and I also just wanted to let everybody know who's still with us that we will be continuing this monthly for the next 12 months. So um, next month will be happening February 21st, and it'll be on the banning of books in Alberta and Canada. So that one you'll also want to tune in on. So just thank you again to everybody. Um, we appreciate you more than you know. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, Ryan. It's always wonderful to, to discuss and then to really learn from, from sure. you both. And uh, oh. I, feel, I feel blessed and I feel joyful 